So we realize, fully realize that China using education as a tool to approaching our young generation from our cultural root. In my place, they started that pre-boarding school in 2016, September. It completely shifted into another language of cultural genocide from such a young age, age four to six. It's a false work. Her parents had no choice. If they had a choice, it's another story. Welcome to Roof of the World, Tibet in Context, a podcast by the Foundation for Nonviolent Alternatives. Thank you so much, every one of you, um, brothers and sisters here. Um, I, the reason I came here is just to raise the alarm. The Tibetan situation is getting way ser- serious, dangerous, ever before. Uh, if this con- situation continues, then I think that the 5,000 years of the Tibetan history of the civilization can be ended. And at the same time, more seriously, I think, uh, if this situation continues more than 15 to 20 years, um, the inside of the people won't be able to receive the result of the reconciliation between His Holiness Dalai Lama and the Chinese government. Because this is such a serious, a dangerous program that Xi Jinping implemented in the Tibetan area is they, since 2016, September, they keeping the, our age four to six kids in the boarding school without having the, any teachers who know any single Tibetan word. They sending the Chinese uh, undergraduate students to be a teacher to get the teaching experience. They are not even taking our kids seriously, just seeing our kids as, as a ex- ex- experimental tools. That was Tibetan professor Gialo speaking to an audience of British parliamentarians at Westminster a few days ago in the UK. Dr. Gallo is an educational sociologist who taught uh, Tibetan language and culture at China's University for Nationalities in the Northwest, Eastern China. He gained a PhD from the University of Toronto and went on to teach education at the University of Yunnan in the PRC. And Dr. Gallo fought for many years to protect Tibetan language and the Tibetan language-based curriculum in schools. But when policies in China took a darker turn, he saw no alternative but to leave Tibet and to bear witness on a global stage. He's done so in the most powerful way possible, prompting an investigation by four UN rights rapporteurs, testifying at the Canadian House of Commons and many other forums. He's worked with Tibet Action Institute to produce a powerful report on Tibet's colonial boarding schools. We're here today to talk about Genla's personal story. It's so rare to have the chance to speak to a Tibetan scholar in exile with this experience and this level of expertise. Tibetans are currently locked into the plateau. Scholars are not allowed to travel. A gathering of Tibetologists from all over the world in Prague last year brought together people from China. It brought together people from Europe, from America, from across Asia, from India, where the Dalai Lama lives. But there were no Tibetan scholars from inside Tibet for the first time in this gathering of scholars. So Tibetans are not able to to mix with their exile counterparts. So I would I would like to speak to you, Professor, about your journey. You were born in Amdo. You received the highest levels of education in the PRC system and in the Western system. 
and you worked over many, many years to create a space for Tibetan religious civilization and culture to thrive. And I'd like to first take you back to those years when you were trying to protect that space for Tibetan language and literature and culture. And how, how did you do that? How did you do that? How did you keep it alive as Chinese policies started to take a turn in a different direction and to tighten further under Xi Jinping? Yeah, uh, thank you so much for getting together to talk about this. Um, let me get uh, back a bit earlier from my life career, and that will uh, articulate the reason why I did for the uh, that was a program when I was in um, faculty members, Tibetan language and cultural department in Northwest University for nationality in Landro. That's university uh, located in Landro. Uh, I was born in, in a village, grew up there, and then it experienced the whole education system. And uh, in 1995, uh, I graduated from my first MA in Tibetan Language and Culture Department. Mm -hmm. Then um, one of the top scholars, who's my teacher, we call his name the Doshir Boche. He decided to appoint me as a faculty member in the same department. And I told I started my academic career there. Uh, I taught there for more than decades. And there are a number of the students who graduated while I was there. I say that over 1,500. And uh, so those students now are working in the Tibetan plant uh, every level of the culture, Tibetan cultural institution and organization. Um, of course, the environment of the Northwest University for Nationality at the Tibetan Language Culture Department, that's a leading source of the Tibetan National Movement, I think, mm -hmm. conceptually. That's a great department. Uh, they shut down that institution as a high institu education institution. And September 2020. Mm, yeah. um, completely shut down. Yeah, completely. Now you can't find the, the department anymore there. Mm, mm. So this, so throughout, in the early year, I, when I was in my department doing my undergraduate study, we engaged all the way about the Tibetan movement and the intellectual we of the uh, we should be. Um, there are a lot number of the key scholar who told us the history there, and then around, of course, we had a at the beginning to the uh, 1979s start that year we settled the they settled the boarding preschool gradually across Tibet, almost every township. And uh, so that's kind of a boarding school, colonial boarding school ran over the 30 years almost. We couldn't understand what they mean, you know. And then in, after I, I got to my first MA in my department, now we start the thinking about it. But something's wrong there with our society and our people's capacity who graduated from university even. But still the society is 
having the difficulty move forward for the development. We struggled with that so a lot. And then we start um, thinking, what's wrong with our education system? At the end, we realized that our colonial school system, boarding school system, has a huge problem, which is with the core elements of the education system. We call that curriculum. Uh, we analyzed the curriculum, or the whole te uh, textbook and the curriculum system, and we realized the whole curriculum is designed as a pure colonial ideology based on. And the contents of textbooks are only 15% or to 25% of the knowledge in the textbook. The rest of the 75 or 80% of the knowledge in the textbook are Chinese book culture. So we realized, fully realized that China using education as a tool to uprooting our young generation from our cultural root throughout the curriculum, design the curriculum system, and also the language policy, language in education policy too. So we- once So we the curriculum was in Chinese? Yeah, okay. curriculum is at the beginning, uh, they allow us, they organize a certain group of people to translate, fully translate into China, Tibetan. Uh, what's the realization we got at that time in 90, around the 1980, 1998, 1998, we realized that the using, the, uh, using our language to teach the Chinese culture to our kids. So they use the so Tibetan they, language. Yeah. Mm. So they call this as a mm. mother one bilingual education. Mm, mm. Then there is a, another one model, which we call the model two bilingual education, which is the allowing uh, teaching that kind of a textbook as so a one subject, and the rest of the subjects are taught in Chinese. Mm. So this means this produce the consequence of having that kind of a curriculum and a boarding school, which is a turn our three generation into the fits and fit neither Chinese society nor Tibetan society. Mm. So it's with lower capacity, even they can't support themselves for the life without uh, becoming a uh, cheap labor. Uh, that one thing. And so, then, so this was in the late 1990s. Yeah. So this was after the, when the Chinese government declared their policy of cutting off the serpent's head, yeah. which is eliminating yeah. the yeah. influence of yeah. the Dalai Lama yeah. from yeah. Tibet. So this followed that meeting. Yes. Yes. The, throughout the history, the, his, uh, after his holiness Dalai Lama left the Tibet, they did a number of the reform and the revolution. I can call you uh, socialism re reform and uh, democratic reform, it's so-called, mm. and also the cultural revolution. Throughout those socialist reform, they just removed our people from the economic system. And uh, with the democratic reforms, reform, they pull out our figure and our people, stakeholders from our own governing system. That they be able to reestablish their own go governing system, Chinese governing system. And then the, even that, this, uh, this is still not enough. Then they carry out the cultural revolution, which is destroyed completely the visual cultural environment entirely. So this is a experience, the process of the, the increase in the colonization. Mm. Uh, that's a general, the brief uh, uh, experience we had. 
you you visited some of those schools. Yeah, I will let you, you. You went to fifty yeah, yeah. of those schools. Yeah, I will schools. let you talk to them more later. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. Um, then mm. after they realize that's a problem, school system has a curriculum problem. I engaged fully engaged with the. Convincing the Chinese policy or Chinese policy makers. For example, on the trip with the Chinese provincial official mm. to the Beijing in the train, we got a serious argument. I argued that why you put those your Chinese historical story in my our textbook instead of similar story from our culture. Mm. You know what they say the first time. They say, if you don't know our story, you won't get food to eat. Hmm. You, you, if you only know your culture, you cannot survive. That's their sort of warning on the train to the way to Beijing. At that time, we just tried to convince the top policymaker change their policy. What they have, what they have now. Another thing, and then I think they still they could not change it, the policy. We organized our own group to produce the, our own textbook based on Tibetan practical culture from grade one to three, from grade three to six or four to six. Which age would that be for? Uh, that uh, I pr published the first one. In 1999, mm -hmm. the second one is uh, 2003. Both book I aimed at young children, yeah. so from the age of four or five. Yeah, yeah. First one, age four to six. Uh, the first one, uh, second one, age from grade one to three. Mm -hmm. mm, both I uh, distribute the, the book across the bed. At that time, after one year, I, my, I distributed my book, and then I had a large-scale uh, uh, training conference in my university. I invited uh, most of the female teachers, and I asked them when I was distributing the book. So putting them to in charge of the teaching my book. And then in 2001, I had a, that conference in my university. At the beginning, the, t t the teacher saying, "That's a fantastic. That's the way we want, because this the catch our not only teacher and the student, but also catch the parents of massive support, mm -hmm. and that increase in t school tendency uh, dramatically. I think." So the teachers were very so happy, happy that you happy provided. About it. Yeah. And then at the same mm -hmm. time, we, at the last time, last day of the conference, and then some most teachers crying. Mm -hmm. Mr. Jalo, this should be at the beginning. Why not? Why today? Mm -hmm. And I explained this. So this is a, I said, oh, Sorry, it is not my fault, your fault either. We just realized our problem of the school system just recently here. And then I, I'm doing this way to try to reverse that situation. Um, so that, that, and then after I distributed my book to another two years, they banned that, those books. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, I think, the situation, first part of my experience. The second part, and I'm now going to tell you the most of the dangerous things ha it's uh, happening now. Um, in 2010, I heard that China is initializing a preschool education program and a policy. In 2011, I collaborate with uh, Chinese University and also other Mongolian, Uyghur and Tibetan scholar, we gathered together. We sort of uh, preforming the what kind of uh, pre-education we should have. In, uh, 
at that time in 2010, I heard, I heard from 2013, China going to implement the policy on the preschool education system in across China. So this was the very young children uh, yeah. before they went yes. to school. Yeah. And before in Tibetan areas, this sort of education level didn't exist. Yeah. Tibetan children yeah. at the age of two, three, four, they didn't have there, there there any. A, until six or seven, they be able to stay mm, with their parents. Stay at home, yeah. And then our report of that conference in 2011, we reported the Minister of uh, Education in Central Government, China. And uh, that report is quite uh, very strong because we first time gathered the local officials, Chinese education researchers, Tibetan, and uh, village representatives all get together. And then uh, since Xi Jinping took a position in t from 2013, they uh, announced the new policy. We're going to have a uh, implement the uh, preschool education policy. They announced, and then from the 2016, some of the places when began in June, some of the places in September, a different bit based on the different location. Um, in my place, they started that pre-boarding school in 2016, September. Before I did not pay attention about this, um, we thought this is going to be no way to against them, no way to resist in this how because we don't know how they're going to implement it at that time. Uh, my brother one day, I think it's the evening, late November the 2016, he calling me. Brother, hey, they come home. Um, your two granny have something strange things happening. We don't know how to ex analyze it. We don't know how to explain it. And I went home to pick up those two grandnieces from the school gate. How old were they? At that time, I wanted to get you four, one at age five. And then I took them to home on the while we were having the chat with uh, my father, my brother, and the sister-in-law, and those two kids, the parents. We were all speaking in Tibetan. I carefully observed them, those two kids. The kids stay like over there, just keep in that distance a little bit, and they kept silent. They, they don't, I carefully observed, they did not hug their parents mm -hmm. and their grandpa either. And then they keep sitting there as a guest or a stranger. You know, I clearly remember when I was visiting other villages relevant in the other village. I, how I remember how I sat as a guest in their room, right? And I thought it's exactly the same feeling. Those two green knees are became a stranger as a guest there. And then again, I could observe them while they're playing, they're just speaking pure Chinese. Mm. This is just three, three months in that preschool, boarding school, boarding preschool. Just three months. Then I saw that as an educational research, I think this is not a unique experience case because China now implemented this policy in entire Tibetan society. It's so even a... three months was enough for those yeah. two little girls yeah. to interact completely yeah. differently yeah. with their parents, with their family, were their grandparents yeah. there as well? Yeah. Yeah. So it's just a uncomfortable, uncomfortable, like uh, mm. in speaking in mother tongue, you know. Mm. This became a, like, it's a not, uh, not a smooth to emotional connection with their fair parents mm. and the family. Mm. Um, and then I asked my brother, what if we don't send the kids to the boarding school? And but all those villagers saying the same thing, says, 
Oh, well, if you don't, we don't have a choice. If we don't send the kids to boarding preschool, then later they won't let our children in the grade one, which means you won't receive the education for entire life. Mm. The second thing is that they're receiving somehow, sometimes they're receiving the benefit from government or a welfare or a staff. Uh, they're going to completely block that for them who mm -hmm. don't want to send the kids. If the situation worse, is they strongly resist the sending the kids to the school, then they're going to simply put in the jail. It's a very uh, common situation. So this is a well, you know in prison. yeah. Have this, you heard of parents who've been? Uh, they, they, they warn them a lot. Mm. Many people, mm. and then parents think anyhow we won't succeed it. We won't in against them. They are right. powerful enough, and then they just well, this is a reality they carry to us. So then I saw this is not a unique case with my two grandnieces. I decided to do a field work. I spent three years summer across the regions to visit those, I think 50 or 52, I don't exactly remember, but uh, uh, more than 50 schools I visited. All those schools, I get a chance to talk to teachers, kids and parents, principles. Were these across the area of Amdo and Calm? Yeah. The, mm -hmm. Yeah. And then the conclusion was the same, with same exactly the same as with my two grandnieces. Kids are getting become a stranger at home. That's how they pull our generation from the cultural mm -hmm. roads. And from between our cultural identity, from the family. This is how I visually see this. Mm. You know, it's a linguistic aspect. They're genocized already, right? And then the psychological aspect, they already genocide the racial aspect from those two kids. They, uh, the psychological foundation being completely reshaped, reinformed. So they they're not they're not thinking they're the pure Tibetan anymore, mm -hmm. I think. In this sense it's the regional genocide, I think. Mm -hmm. And the completely shift into the another language is the cultural genocide from such a young age, age four to six. It's a force work. Her parent has no choice. If they had a choice, it's another story. Mm. They don't have a choice. That means forcefully implementing this kind of program uh, by using the state power. That's a country, the China is a powerful, as they say, mm. they are a powerful country. I think economically, I don't agree with the other part, as a powerful country. Mm. Mm.